about looking beyond the commitment of words. Because we know that words matter, but we know that when we talk about commitment, what does that really mean? Because we're seeing a, 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 lot of, a lot of words being spoken throughout our society, but when it comes down to a commitment, what does that, what does that mean, and especially for a Christian? And this morning we're going to talk about uh, one of the superheroes of the Bible. And we're going to talk about David. David's one of these people that whenever we get into the Old Testament, David is a superhero. And we think about superheroes, we've heard of these superheroes all throughout our childhood. If we've grown up in any religious group, you've heard about David. If you haven't grown up in any religious group, you've heard about David. Because you've heard about this little tiny boy. And the way that we phrase David is he's this little tiny kid who can't do anything else. And he just happens to come and just happens to knock over a nine-foot, nine-inch giant of the Philistines. But sometimes what we forget about David is we forget about David's transformation. David had a pretty big transformation, and he had it even before Goliath. So we're going to spend some time talking about that this morning as we get into the idea of commitment. And next week, we're going to look at another superhero of the Bible. We're going to talk about Abraham. So if you want to go home and you want to do some research on Abraham, we're going to come back next week. We're going to talk about Abraham and the fact that God told him to get up and to move. And he didn't know where he was going to go. So as we get into our plan for 2024, and if you haven't grabbed one of those, those plans are out um, there. And by the way, there's some sign-up lists in the back. I encourage you to sign up on those to meet, uh, to meet with the elders. We've got an event coming up that we're going to fellowship together as, as part of our, our plan, part of our congregational efforts to, to get there and to be together because we want to really, we want to express and we want to live our faith. We want to go out into the world and we want to take our faith with us wherever we go because we want to live a faith that's based on commitment beyond just what we speak about. In fact, this morning you sung about commitment. And we mentioned a couple weeks ago, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 15. When I sing, I'm going to sing with the Spirit. I'm going to sing with understanding. When I pray, I'm going to pray in the Spirit. I'm going to pray with understanding. Because when we talk about these things, they're, they're, they're superheroes of the Bible, but they're big words. And last week, Jack mentioned two scriptures to us. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 3. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. Now, that is, that is a big word for commitment, isn't it? Commit to the Lord your work, what you are doing in life. We know in Colossians chapter 3, it says, In whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Then it goes on to talk about when you're working at your job, you need to work as if you're working for Jesus. You need to work as if you're working for God. So if you did that, how would your work change? Because a lot of people get up tomorrow, and what do they say? First words, ugh. Right? First words are, ugh. Why? I got to go to work. Because a lot of times what we find ourselves in, we talked about this about two years ago, is we find ourselves in something that's, that's really, that, that, that's not in a place where we should be. But when we commit our work to the Lord, our plans become established. You see this in the life of David. You see this in the life of Abraham, our two superheroes that we're going to spend some time on. Johnny read a moment ago, and it's a scripture that Jack mentioned last week, Psalm 37 and verse 5. Commit your way. So you have commit your work, and you have commit your way to the Lord. Now notice what the psalmist says. And by the way, this is David. He says, commit your way to the Lord and trust in him, and he will act. So if you commit your way to the Lord, and you trust in the Lord, God is going to act. But there, there's an essential part of that. What do you do? What do you do? If God acts, what do you do? If God opens a door, what do you do? Because when we think of the term of commitment, let's, let's define commitment. I'm going to redefine it here in a, in a few minutes. But Commitment defined by Webster's Dictionary is when you, are, when you are dedicated to a cause or you're dedicated to an activity. So if you say, I'm committed to that, that means you're dedicated. 
I mean, is this going to be a part of your life? I mean, it, it's really, when you say that, you're going to do some things when you commit. You're not only going to speak words, you're going to make time for something, aren't you? You're going to make time for that. If, if you send out uh, an invitation and people send back an RSVP, you ask them, RSVP. So they send back and they let you know that they're going to be there. And, and you call them and you say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm really doing this. Are you committed to being here? And they said, I'm committed. I'm committed. That means they're dedicated to the cause or to the activity. It's also a pledge or an undertaking. That means you've got some responsibility with, with commitment. You've got some things in your life that you're going to have to be able that you're going to have to be able to do. So it's dedication to a cause or an activity. It's going to be a pledge. It's going to be undertaking. Now some synonyms. Learned about this in school a long time ago. Some synonyms of commitment are to be loyal. Think about that for a moment. We, sometimes we don't associate loyalty with commitment, but that's really what it is. If you're committed, then you're loyal. You have your allegiance. Most of us, probably here, I would say that most of us went to school at a time where every morning, and I can remember uh, every morning we would get to our homeroom class and we would be there, and the moment that the teacher would settle us down, an announcement came on came on. Uh, the, the overhead speaker. And it said, now it's time for the Pledge of Allegiance. And we said, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to this republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible. Right? Indivisible. What's that mean? We're not going to be divided. It's going to be one nation. Why? Because we are all pledging our allegiance to the United States of America. And that's something that we did. That was just kind of something that's there. And everybody says we need to bring back the pledge. Why? Because allegiance is our loyalty. It's our commitment. Notice this next word down here. It's devotion. That's a religious word. Our, our devotion before God, meaning devotion is a dedication. It, it's a time of service. So we've got all of these words, and at the end, how about this one? Another biblical word that we read, steadfastness. That means I'm committed, and I'm not going to move. I'm going to stand firm on my commitment. So when you think about commitment, I want you to just kind of take that sheet of paper that you have in front of you, and maybe you've got a different definition of commitment. Maybe you've got something that's there, because here's what commitment is. I told you we're going to redefine it a little bit. Commitment is more than words. Words only take you so far. In James chapter 2, when it talks about faith and works, a man says, you show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And I know that's different than words, but listen, how do you know if somebody has faith? It comes out in their actions. So if you tell me, I have faith, I've got faith in God, have you prayed today? How have you depended on God today? Have, I've got faith. You really have faith? Because sometimes there's words. We used to do this thing with youth groups, and it's really fun. I've mentioned it before. That is, is you would do this thing called a trust fall. And what a trust fall is, is, is you would get somebody up on a stage like this, and you would have their friends, their closest friends. Now I want you to think of your five closest friends. You're five, okay? And, and, and you would have your five friends stand, and your five friends, they would interlock arms, and they would hold each other, and they would be across, and the person would be up here, and we'd tell the youth group member, hey, listen, okay, do you trust your friends? Absolutely. Do, do, and they would, they would look at them like this, right? We'd say, do you have faith in your friends? Absolutely. And they say, okay, turn around. Why? Nope, you trust your friends, right? Yeah. See how it went from yeah to e e e e yeah? Do you have faith in your friends? <laughs> Maybe. Turn around. And they turn around, they get right to the edge, and we'd say, okay, cross your arms. They cross your arms like this. We'd say, now I want you to fall backwards, and your friends are going to catch you. Huh? You trust your friends, right? Yeah. You have faith in them? <laughs> I don't know. But wait a second, these are your five closest friends. 
You know what? Almost, well, I had one, and all the time I've done it, I've only had one kid who just went, sounds good, crossed his arms and just went backwards. He had some pretty good friends and was probably a little bit crazy. Because everybody else would do this. They would get right to the edge, and you'd say, okay, lean back, and they go, okay, you guys ready? No, 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 no. If you trust them, they're ready. Right? So it's more than just words. You show me your faith that you've been talking about, but you've got to put something else into it. So faith is more than just words. How about this one? Faith is more than just thoughts. It's more than just thought. It's more than just what's up here. It's more than what we speak. It's more than just up here. And here's why. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, you think about that. That that seems illogical to a lot of people. It's more than just what we think. It's more than just what kind of occurs up here. Because we can have a lot of thoughts, right? Remember Ananias and Sapphira? They had a pretty good thought. Their thought was, we're going to sell a piece of land just like Barnabas did at the end of Acts chapter 4. And Barnabas donated that money, and he was called the son of encouragement. So here's my thinking. Ah, that's where we go bad. Because God's thoughts are greater than our thoughts. God's ways are greater than our ways. I thought, right? I thought this was a good idea. I thought I had faith. I thought it's more than just it's more than just what you think. It's more than just those words. Remember the, the young man that came to Jesus and said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. You know what Jesus told him? Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So it's more than just actions. I can prove to you faith is more than just actions. You ever have somebody who doesn't have faith show up at a church building? It happens. You ever have somebody who has no faith in God sing Amazing Grace? It happens. It's So when we talk about commitment, we're talking about more than just words. We're talking about more than just thoughts. We're talking about more than just actions. And you say, well, Chris, what, what is commitment? Here's what commitment is. We're going to talk about it both this week, and we're going to talk about it next week. And commitment is this. Commitment is transformation. That's what commitment is. And let me give you a really good example of, of, of transformation. How many of you? Not by a show of hands, just by a, a show of smiles or just a simple thought. How many of you committed yourself to taking care of your family? And when that first child was born, you became your parents overnight. Something that you never thought would happen. Then all of a sudden you had a child and you're like, oh, I've got to raise this child. I've got to protect this child. I'm going to be there for this child. I'm going to do whatever it takes. And you were committed to that. And the reason you're committed is because you've now been transformed. Your life became a whole lot different when you had that child because you got up in the middle of the night. And and when that child slept, this is always fun to talk to parents about, when that child slept through the night for the first time, I'm the parents to go in and stare at their child. And they hover that hand over. I've had parents wake a child up. I've heard them. They go in, they go, he was sleeping. I had to make sure he was awake. So I kind of shook them a little bit to see if they were, to see if they were still alive. Why? Because it's my jaw. And it, it, it goes backwards, right? So, so when two people get married, what do they do? Promise to love, honor, cherish. You know, we've got all that stuff in there, right? They become committed. They become transformed because no longer is it just me. It's me and you. We're together. The Bible says we become one flesh, richer for poor, sickness and health, good and bad. The great times and the horrible times. We're committed. There's a transformation process that's there. You know, those scriptures that we mentioned at the very beginning, when you commit your way to the Lord, that's a transformation process. Most people don't want to be fully transformed. They want to change. And there is a difference in changing and being transformed. You know, last night, we, we watched what I consider to be one of the greatest cartoons in the world. We watched this cartoon. It's a kid's cartoon, and it's called Hermie and Wormy. Hermie's a caterpillar. 
And, and Hermie has to be reminded that he's not like Antonio the ant. And I thought about this as we were watching this, this kid's show last night. I was thinking, man, this is what I'm talking about tomorrow. He's not like Antonio the ant. He's not big, strong, and can pick up 50 times his body weight. He's not there. So, so the Hermie, the, the, the worm, the caterpillar, he, he, Hermie and Wormy, they, they pray to God, and God talks to him, okay, because it's a cartoon, right? So he, and he speaks to him verbally, and he says, I'm not done with you yet. Then at the moment, Hermie, the caterpillar, falls asleep. He builds that cocoon. And the next morning, the cocoon opens, and he becomes a butterfly. He did not change. He was transformed. See, because he changed a lot of things that he tried to do before he was a caterpillar. He changed those, right? He changed the way he walked. He changed the way that, that, that he thought he could pick up a rock. He changed the way, well, like, like the snail, that he could try to put a house on his back. He changed, but he was not transformed. And when God got a hold of him, God transformed him. Does it sound familiar? It's a passage that we know. And the passage is in Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2, the beginning part of that passage is the challenge. The second part of that, verse 2, is the transformation. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He says, I challenge you. I challenge you to be fully dedicated. Because a lot of times, people aren't fully dedicated to God. They wear the name, but they're not fully dedicated. Now, Gandhi was a man that I have a lot of problems with. I, Gandhi and I, we, would, we could sit down, have a cup of coffee, and that we could talk. But one of the things that Gandhi said was about Christians is he says, I like your Christ, I'm not sure about your Christians. That's what he said. And the reason he said it is because of what he saw, right? He saw, and we know flawed people, and we can give excuses for Christians and Gandhi all of our life. We're not here to give excuses. We're here to give the reasons as to why we live the way we do. So when somebody gets a hold of you and you have that transformation, that's what Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Some translations say spiritual worship. But he says in verse 2, there's a challenge. Here's verse 2. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Not to be changed but to be transformed. That word transform is where we get the word metamorphosis. That's where that caterpillar turns into that butterfly. We've been totally transformed. That's what commitment in God is. When you commit your way to the Lord, you're becoming totally transformed. You say, God, here's me. Let's go. And if you do that, you've got to buckle up. Because God is going to take you places where you never thought you would go. He's going to give you opportunities that you never thought that you would have. And if you don't believe me, think about David for a minute. And I know that's supposed to say warrior, so don't worry about it. Think about David. How do you see David? The superhero of the Bible. The little tiny boy with the slingshot. And he took those stones from that brook. He put one in there. And he went sling, and it went round and round and round and round, and he let that thing go, hit Goliath in the forehead, knocked him down, went over and cut off his head. We like that story. But how do you see David? Do you see David as a shepherd? Do you see David as king? Do you see him as a warrior? Do you see him as a servant? I know how we paint David. It, 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 you may even add to that list. The second thing that we think about David a lot is we think David sinned. We give David a lot of grief for that. I think we do some of that too. But how do you see David? And when you think about David, how do you see him? In fact, if you're in 1 Samuel chapter 17, I, I want to camp out there for a few minutes. We're going to be going some chapters before, so just kind of get some pages ready to turn, because I want you to think about this. How did David's family see him? How did David's family see him? Look in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now, I'll say this. Probably, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, right above the chapter, you have, this, you have the man-made heading David and Goliath, so you know what's coming. You know that, there, that there's going to be this big thing that happened. But so, so David goes to see his brothers, right? His brothers are in the army. So he goes to see his brothers, and I want you to notice something. I'm going to jump back up to verse 24 for a moment, but I want to focus on verse 28. 
But let's look at 24. Get some background. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, that's Goliath, they fled and they were very afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he has come to defy Israel. The king uh, will enrich the man who kills him with riches and give him his daughter and make his father's house free of Israel. The men of Israel are saying that. They're telling everybody else the great reward that's going to happen. But none of them would step forward. So this is what happens, verse 26. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? Really nice way of saying, who's this jokester? Who's this person who has no idea who God is? What's wrong with them? That's what he's saying. But then he says this, verse 27. The people answered and said in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. So David says, what's going to happen to this guy? Right? What's going to happen? Who, who, this guy's coming out. He's bad-mouthing Israel, bad-mouthing God's people. What's God going to do for him? What's the king going to do for him? What's going to happen? Notice verse 28. Then Elab, his oldest brother, when he heard, he spoke to the men. When his oldest brother heard this, it says in verse 28, his anger was kindled against David. That means it's starting to burn. It's getting there. It's popping. It's cracking, just like a kindled fire. And it's getting there. But it's instantly becoming a flame. And it's rising pretty quick. And it's rising pretty fast. And he says this, why have you come down here? That's what he says. As if to say, why is this any your business? Why have you come here? Look at what he says. And with whom have you left alone with those few sheep in the wilderness? He says, hey, little shepherd boy, it's time that you go home. By the way, think of the tone that he said it. He's angry. You ever have somebody, as you're working on something, come up and tell you how to do it, and they have no idea? Now, some of you just smile, right? You love those people, don't you? You love it when they come up, and they've never done what you're doing before in their entire life, and they come up, and they tell you how to do it. What do you do? You want to become David's brother, right? And you want to say, hey, I got an idea. Why don't you get out of here? Why don't you get out of here? Because there's a lot of people who tell you something can't be done, but they themselves will never even try it. That's what Elam's doing. He's telling David, hey, what about those sheep in the wilderness? Look what he says. I know your presumption and your evil heart that you've come down here to see the battle. He says, you just came down here to be nosy. That's what he's saying. You just came down here to be nosy, so why don't you just go home, mama's boy? Why don't you just get out of here? Go back to those few sheep that you got down there and leave us alone. How did David's brothers see him? How did they see him? Well, let's go backwards for a minute. Just just for a a, a few minutes, I I want to go backwards. And I want to go backwards into 1 Samuel chapter 16. Because this is how David's viewed. And we have to go backwards so that we can go forwards. doesn't make any sense, but it will. So Samuel is going to go down. We know from chapter 15 that the Spirit of the Lord is no longer with Saul. So he comes to David's family, Samuel does, and it says, I'm going to jump on down if I can for a minute. I'm going to jump on down to verse 6 of 1 Samuel chapter 16. And it says, when they came, he looked at Elab. Now, this is the guy we just talked about who mouthed off David, who told David to go home, stop being nosy. It says, he came to Elab and thought, surely, because he's going to anoint a new king, because Saul's no longer going to be king. So he sees Elab, the son of Jesse, the, the oldest brother, the biggest one, the one who's going to have, if we remember our Old Testament, who's going to have the birthright. He's the oldest. That means he's the best. That's the way we think about it. Sorry for those of you who aren't the oldest, but that's the way we think about it. So it comes to Elab, and he thought to himself, Samuel did, surely the Lord's uh, the anointed is before him. And the Lord said to Samuel, don't look on his appearance. Don't look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see a man as a man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So the next time that you hear that verse in the book of Acts, that David was a man after God's own heart, 
Go back to this verse. The Lord does not look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at his heart. Do you want to change the way that you think about people? Stop looking at the outward appearance. Probably one of the examples that we have in our life of this was probably somebody that you may have watched or that your children watched growing up, and his name was Fred Rogers. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Won't you be my neighbor? And, and the reason Mr. Rogers thought that is because he was bullied. He was kicked around. He was made fun of growing up, and he wanted to change the way things were done. And, and Mr. Rogers had a plaque that said in his working studio, and the plaque came from, um, it came from a play. The play translated into French or, or into English from French is called The Little Prince. It's by Saint, uh, Saint, Saint uh, Antonio. I forget his last name. But on that plaque that hung in Mr. Rogers' workplace, what it said is, Essential, es invisible, es don juris. What that meant is, and I just butchered French, so sorry for those of you who can speak it. What that meant is the essential things are not seen in your eyes. The essential things are not seen in your eyes. What that meant is you've got to look beyond what you can see, and you get to the heart of the person. Now, how did Fred Rogers change the scope of television? And we would all say this, we need another Fred Rogers today. We need another Mr. Rogers neighborhood. We need that. How was he able to do that? Because he looked beyond the scope of the outward appearance. And if you don't believe me, you can go home and watch this. Mr. Rogers caused a lot of controversy when he took a kid's pool. He took the kid's pool and he took the police officer that always came by. And, and he was cooling his feet off. Very simple scene. He was cooling his feet off in the pool in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood because it was hot outside, boys and girls. And we're going to take some time and we're going to cool our feet. And the police officer came by. And he looked at the police officer and he said, are you feeling kind of hot? He says, well, yes, I am. He said, would you like to cool your feet in this pool with me? He said, I would love to. He said, well, sit on down. And he cooled his feet in the pool with Mr. Roger. Now, to us as Christians, we say, sounds like a good idea. But in the day and age when he did it, Mr. Rogers was white. The police officer was black. Somebody asked Mr. Rogers, hey, we don't really do that. He said, why? you got to look beyond the outward appearance. you got to look to the essentials, right? That's what he was able to do. That's how he was able to do it. That's how he was able to reach through that television because he saw what people truly were. Now, I use that example because look at what Samuel did. Samuel looked at Elib and said, this has got to be God's one. And, and God said, that's not him. Stop looking at the appearance. He says, I'm looking at the man's heart. Now notice this, verse 8 of 1 Samuel, chapter 16. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel and said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse said to Shammah, he, he had him pass by, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to these, The Lord has not chosen these. So verse 11, ready? Here it is. Verse 11, how did David's family view him? Samuel said to Jesse, are all of your sons here? Are all of them here? He just paraded seven of them by him. And he says, uh, there remains yet the youngest. <laughs> I like that word, right? There remains yet the youngest. Some translations there have the smallest. Why? Surely not him. Surely not David. He says, there remains the youngest, and behold, he is keeping the sheep. W where did his older brother tell him to go back to when he came to the battle? Go back to the sheep. Ah, David's out there with the sheep. 
That's, that's what he saw. That's what his family saw. He, he's, just, he's just the shepherd boy that's out there. Don't, don't pay attention to him. In fact, how about this one? And this one's pretty unique too because if, if you take what we know, excuse me, about David and Saul, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, if, if you just kind of flip back there a little bit, you'll probably have a heading of, of that chapter that says the Lord uh, rejects Saul or the Lord is done with Saul, something like that. You go over to chapter 16, David is anointed as king. You go to about the middle of chapter 16, about verse 14 through the end of the chapter, you find out that David, having been anointed by Samuel, ends up in service to Saul to come and play music before Saul to calm, to calm his soul. So here's what happens. So David goes home. He comes back to the battle. He goes back to check on his brothers and to bring them some things. He finds that there's this discussion going on, and his brothers tell him to be quiet and go home, but notice what happens. It says, and I want to, I want to go back here to verse 29 of 1 Samuel 17, after his brothers mouth him off because they saw he was a shepherd boy, David says, what have I done now? He says, was it not a word? He says, what have I done? I've just asked a question. That's all I've done. Notice what it continues. It says, and when he turned away from them toward another and spoke in the same way, the people answered again as before. Everybody is telling David, you're just a shepherd boy. Get out of here. Leave us alone. We're warriors. We got stuff to do. And what was their stuff to do? Do you remember? To run away. That was their stuff. We're going to go out here. We're going to line up for battle. Oh, here he comes. We got to go now. That was what they did. Now, we, would, we wouldn't say, hey, those are warriors, would we? We'd say, they just ran away. But notice what goes on. Verse 31, when the words that David spoke were heard, they were repeated before Saul, and he sent for David. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight the Philistines. David says, I'll go. We remember that, right? David took all the thoughts of his family and all the thoughts of the people and all the thoughts of Samuel, and he put those aside, and he says, I'm, I'll go do it. But no one else would. David says, I'll go do it. Now look at what happens in verse 33. Saul says to David, ready? What did Saul think of David? Later he tried to kill him. What's he think of David now? He says, but you are not able to go against the Philistine and fight with him, for you are just a youth. He says, you can't go do that. You're just a kid. Now, our human thinking, knowing the rest of the story, says David's ready to go. There's a quote that says, I first heard it from a man by the name of Kevin Miller, and he said, the one who says it can't be done should stop interrupting the one doing it. One of my favorite man-made quotes. The one who says it can't be done should stop interrupting the one doing it. You ever been there? That's where David's at. You can't go. He says, you're but a kid. Then he says this, and this is a man of war from his youth. But notice what David says. Ready? Talk about a transformation. And you talk about a commitment. David's not backing down from responsibility. He's not backing down. He's not finding an excuse. He could have gone, okay, sounds good. And he could have gone home. He was safe, supposedly safe. But he says this, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. Everybody knew him as a shepherd. And there came a lion or a bear and, the lamb, and took a lamb from the flock. I went after him. We always talk about this, that David struck them down. How brave, courageous, insane, if we want to use that term, is it that when a lion takes a sheep or a bear takes a sheep, you go, I'm going. There's a parable about that in the New Testament. Parable of a hundred sheep, if a man loses one, doesn't say how he loses it, does it? It just says he loses one. What's he do? He goes after it. Because he leaves the 99 because they're safe, and he goes after it. There's a lot of, of, of information here. There's a lot that we can take home. But he says, I went after it, and I struck it down. I delivered it out of his mouth, and if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, and I struck him, and I killed him. David says, I knocked him out. I gave him a chance. I knocked him out. I took the sheep out of its mouth, and if it got up again, then I killed it. I wouldn't mess with David. 
So he's telling this to Saul, and it says, Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defiled the living, he has defiled the armies of the living God. And he says this, verse 37. You want transformation? Here's your transformation. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And at that point, Saul goes, Go get him. Go get him. That's where the transformation has seen in David's life because Saul saw him as a youth. So here's my question to you. It's a one-year question. One-year question. By this time next year, where will you be? Lord willing, you think, Chris, I'm not even planning for anything. That's perfectly fine. I think the Bible talks about we need to plan, but that's a whole different story. And somebody says, well, I don't know where I'm going to be. I don't know if I want to do it. I don't know if this is going to... Well, here's what happens. If the Lord's going to give us a year, the year's going to come anyway, you might as well make the best of it. You got to start doing the best you can to grow. You got to start doing the best you can to get out there. God expects it out of us. God wants us to. That's why Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 13, especially 13, 1 through 5, that grace has been given to man according to his abilities and where to use it. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16 that we've been given abilities by God that we need to be using. 1 Peter chapter 4, we need to be using those abilities. Colossians chapter 3, we glorify God in everything that we do. So where do you want to be next year? How do you want this? And how the greater question is this, how do you see yourself? If you want transformation to occur, you've got to change the way you view yourself. And here's what I mean by that. Answer this question. Go home, spend some time. Think about it during the week. Who are you? Who are you? As where you sit right now, who are you? Many people lose their life because they lose their meaning. Because what happens to a lot of people is, and even religious people, is we become, if you will, we become negative thinking people. Well, the Bible tells us that we're to think on the good things. We're to think on the things that are just and holy and excellent. And we're to meditate. We're to think deep on those things. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Because we've been transformed. We've left this life, and now we've got this life. We've got the greatest life ever. And sometimes what we don't think is we don't think that we are able but we have to realize that God knows us. He told Jeremiah that. He says, even before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I knew you. The book of Ecclesiastes says that God has put eternity into man's heart. So when we think that we are able, sometimes we say, I, I, I can't do it. But we hear people using this verse all the time. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The majority of people use that verse totally out of context. Because you have to go backwards, and you have to go backwards to see something. What Paul says is, because I have Jesus, Philippians chapter 2, because I'm thinking the same mind as Christ, I'm thinking the mind of a servant, it says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, that's why I can say, do not grumble or complain, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of light in the crooked and per perverse generation. He's saying, because you are able, because you have the mind of Jesus. Because we have it written for us. We have it right there for us. You know, David, God did not come down and say, David, I'm going to make you the strongest person on the face of the earth. David did not all of a sudden receive a special rock from God. He didn't receive a special sling. You know what David did? David used what he had and used what he could grab. But because he committed his way to the Lord, God was shining through in David's life. You think, Chris, God had a hand in that rock. Yeah, I think he did. And I think God had a hand in how you got here too. I think God had a hand in how he designed you, how he's given you the things that you have in your life. But we've got to think that we're able. We've got to transform that thinking. That's why in Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, I counted everything as rubbish for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus. We're going to talk about that knowledge in a minute. But he goes on down and he says, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead. And he says that in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. And a little bit later, Paul says this. As a transformation of the mind in verse 20 of Philippians chapter 3, he says, you're a citizen. Our citizenship is in heaven. So stop thinking here 
and start thinking there. You've got to transform that thinking. It's because we're citizens of heaven and we have that in our mind that we've been transformed that the things of this earth, we see that the essentials are not seen with our eyes. Remember what Paul says to the Corinthian church? Paul tells them that the things that are seen are temporary. That's why he can say at the very beginning of that passage, he can say, do not lose heart. Even though your outward man is wasting away, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Do not look at the things that are seen. Do not look at the temporary. Because he says the things that aren't seen are eternal. The essentials are not seen with your eye. Samuel made the mistake with David. Jesse made the mistake with David. His brothers made the mistake with David. Saul made the mistake with David because David knew that he had a higher calling and that turned David into something else. And whether you want to believe this tonight or this morning or not, this is you because you are in a battle. You're in a battle each and every day. We, we may think to ourselves, hey, we're not like David. Really? David was given a sling and a rock. You are given the full armor of God to stand against the power of the devil, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. You're giving the full armor of God so that you can stand because God told us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 37 that you've been made more than conquerors. We think of conquering people and we think, man, look at those. Look at those conquering people. You've been made better than them. That's who you are. That's who God has made you to be, is more than conquerors, overcomers in this life, because you've been given the greatest gift. And that citizenship in heaven, because God looked down at you and God said, you have the opportunity to go to heaven. Now you may think to yourself, well, da Chris, David was chosen by God. I'm glad you brought that up. Thanks for bringing that up. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 says, You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a people for his own possession. How did God choose you? God gave you the abilities. He gave you everything. He gave you the mind. And he gave you an open heart. And it was up to you to seek and to find those answers. And when you found them, they should have transformed your life into where it is now. They should have transformed you, and you should have gone from this immature kind of person. You should have desired the, the milk as newborn babes to grow thereby. You get to the meat of the gospel, and you take the gospel to the world. Because what happens is we may believe that we're able, and we may believe that we're citizens, but yet in our life, we have become card catalogs for the Bible. I can tell you where baptism is. I can tell you, Chris. It's in John 3. I can tell you it's in Matthew chapter 3. I can tell you it's in Mark 16, 16. I can tell you it's in Acts 22, 16. I can tell you it's, it's in Acts chapter 2. I got it all in here, man. Well, good. What are we going to do about it? We can become a card catalog or we can become a warrior. Because remember, commitment is more than just words. Commitment is more than just thoughts. Commitment is more than just actions. Commitment is that transformation into our life as we go into the world. When you see a person that's truly transformed by the gospel of Christ, you'll see somebody that's on fire. And you'll see somebody that cannot contain their excitement. We're all excited in different ways. I, 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 I hoot and holler when I get excited. Some people are very stoic, and that's okay. We can't contain that, and we want it. We want more of it. And we start to see that, that we're able, that our citizenship is in heaven, that we truly in our life, that we are warriors because of who God created us to be. So it's not our way, but it's God's way. It's God's ability to change our life. And if you're a Christian, He's already changed your life. So what are we going to do about it? If He hasn't changed your life, if He hasn't transformed your life, you need to ask this, are you ready to go through that open door? Because God has allowed you the opportunity to do that. He's given you the choice so that you can become chosen. He's given you the ability that you can go out into this world with more than a sling and a rock, but that you can go out with a full armor of God, and we've got to do it. There's people waiting on us. There's people waiting on you. There's people waiting on me to just go to them and say, hey, 
Let me tell you about Jesus. It sounds so cliche, but how many people in the world hate their life? And how many Christians love their life? It's time that we realize our commitment is through our transformation. Just as David's was, ours can be too. So now it's to you. I've talked long enough, probably way too long. So what are you going to do about it? How are you going to take that into the world? Or are you just going to go leave this building, get in your car, drive down our driveway, go out 278, go right, go left, go wherever. And is today just going to be another day? Or is today going to be the day that you truly live in the transformation that you've been given? I'll leave that to you. If there's anything that we can do to help you out this morning, whether it's prayers in the church, whether it's you baptize your mission of your sins, we want to do everything that we can to help you out this morning. If you want to make that known, you can do that, but we want you.